Hello, my name is uh, Jimmy Noake. I'm the Undersecretary Technical for the Ministry of Infrastructure Development in Solomon Islands. Ministry of Infrastructure Development is also responsible uh, for the Maritime Administration of Solomon Islands. The topic of my presentation today is called From Village to Global. And why is the Pacific in the roadmap process on greenhouse gas emissions reductions from ships? And what are some of the red lines for small island development states such as ours in the Pacific? Like some of our colleagues in the Pacific, I have had the privilege and the opportunity to, to participate at the IMO Maritime Marine Environmental Protection Committee or MEPC meetings, uh, including the intersessional working groups on the agenda item seven, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from ships since 2016 at MEPC 70, when the MEPC agreed on a roadmap for the development of IMO's initial strategy on GSG reductions from international ships. I'm also truly honored to be part of that historic moment for the IMO when the IMO's initial strategy was adopted by MEPC 72 back in April this year in 2018. We in the Pacific should be very proud of our achievements at the IMO on the issue of greenhouse gas emissions reductions from ships. We have been quite instrumental in ensuring that the IMO adopts an initial strategy on greenhouse, greenhouse gas uh, reductions from ships. I would like to thank our colleagues from the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Kiribati, Fiji and others in the Pacific that have joined forces with us to ensure that the initial, an initial strategy was adopted by the IMO. So why is the Pacific in the international shipping GHG emissions reduction fight? Well, we simply cannot afford not to, to be in this fight. In the Solomon Islands, five of our islands have already disappeared underwater over the past seven decades, and one drawing its last breath as recently as 2011. We are at the forefront of climate change devastating effects, so we cannot afford not to participate in the GHG emissions reduction fight at the international level. Whilst the IMO has adopted and the initial strategy, real work has to start very soon. According to studies done by some Australian scientists, in the past 20 years, sea levels in Solomon Islands have risen 7 millimeters to 10 millimeters annually. Now, this is three times the global average. And according to the International Panel for Climate Change uh, report, or the IPCC, global rises are expected to reach five millimeters annually in the second half of the century. And for some islands, some island countries like Kiribati and Tuvalu, they are forecasted to be among the first on the planet to disappear in the water if rising sea levels are not arrested. Also, decades of uh, storm data also show that tropical cyclones in the Pacific are getting more and more intense as ocean temperatures rises according to various scientific climate reports. And it's, it is not just severity of cyclones that are already affecting us, but also seawater contaminating our fresh water, heat waves, storm surges, droughts. Climate change is also seeing increased seawater temperatures and acidifications 
which is catastrophic to our marine environment. An ecosystem such as our fisheries and coral reefs on which our island populations are so dependent upon. Our leaders have urged us to do all we can to tackle emissions from all sectors and urgently to keep global temperatures increases to no more than 1.5 degrees for our very survival. The most recent assessment of GSG emissions from international ships that was published by IMO in 2014 showed that international shipping contributes to some 2.2% of the global GSG emissions. Whilst this might not sound a lot, it is similar to emissions of countries such as Germany and Japan. What is more worrying is these emissions are projected to rise by between 50 and 250 percent. And these are not covered by the UNFCCC, as these are international emissions and, as, and are dealt with by the IMO. Our physical presence and voice at the IMO's intersectional working group and the MEPC meetings on agenda item 7 on GSG reductions from ships was crucial in achieving what is currently in the IMO's initial strategy. Although the initial strategy did not have the high, the high ambitions that we had asked for, but it is a start. And as I have mentioned, more work is now needed on specific measures that can be implemented before 2023 to enable achieving the 1.5 temperature target of the Paris Agreement. It is also critical for us that impacts on states such as Solomon Islands, who are not responsible for the emissions that have and continue to cause climate change, are addressed and taken into account. Without the Pacific's active participation, the voices of those who are most vulnerable would not be heard. During the session of Working Group 4 meeting last month, Solomon Islands and Belgium did a presentation on the IPCC report. And it is very clear from the report that in order to meet the Paris Agreement temperature goal of limiting global temperatures rise to no more than 1.5 degrees, all nations and all sectors must work together to, to take rapid and far-reaching transitions to low carbon economies over the next 10 to 20 years to ultimately reach net zero emissions. If we overshoot, then we must find ways to capturing carbon to bring the temperature back down. Globally, we are on track to global warming of three to four degrees, which will be catastrophic for us here in the Pacific. There are huge costs as well as physical implications of not keeping below 1.5 degrees. So what are the progress and challenges so far? Uh, so far, a process has been agreed for moving forward, but no specific measures. And the IMO has also invited IMO members to submit proposals to MEPC 74 on how impacts assessment might be done. Now, since some states oppose moving forward with measures such as market-based measures that are needed to drive the level of change needed, we are likely to see focus in the year, in the near future, only on amending energy efficiency design indexes or EEDI for new ships and ship energy efficiency management plans for existing ships, which alone won't result in the reductions needed for 1.5. Also, we need to make sure that our island nations, so dependent on international shipping, do not suffer dis disproportionate negative impacts as a result of IMO adopting 
and implementing measures to reduce emissions, such as increased transport costs, which will affect food security, disaster preparedness, response, are some of the examples. Impacts on states. Now, baselines for Pacific Island countries re will require significant effort urgently if impacts on Pacific seeds are to be adequate, adequately assessed and addressed. If procedures and details on what impact assessments include on who, how, what is in resolve before MEPC 74, then this will delay submissions of proposals for specific measures as we have agreed that measures need to consider impacts on states, particularly for seeds and LDCs in parallel. We also need to make sure that impact assessments consider how impacts will be addressed, whether they can be avoided or mitigated, for example, which basically means Pacific aren't going to be able to submit proposal for measures alone we will need to be a co-sponsor. We have raised this point repeatedly during the Intersessional Working Group 4 and the MEPC 73 on the need for the capacity development for baseline research, as well as participating in impact assessment and proposal submissions. Cook Islands have also repeatedly made this point that the IMO's technical assistance budget is already highly constrained and there are no more funding for such additional support, so IMO will have to find additional funds for this. And now, knowing that we cannot make possible proposals for measures alone, given the work likely to be involved, Pacific Islands will need to persuade, to persuade other better resourced members, such as the UK, the France, New Zealand, even Germany, to lodge proposals for measures we want to be progressed, such as market-based measures. Lack of capacity means inability to actively participate without support. Our participation in the process is going to need our government's priority, resources, uh, partnerships for at least the next five years and beyond. So how do we make sure that there are funding to pay uh, compensation given progressing market-based measures isn't going to happen fast enough? Because it cannot just be capacity building and technical cooperation. And just to um, sum up on my presentation, there is still a lot of work to be done. So we must continue this fight to make sure that our voices are continued to be heard since we are at the forefront of climate change effects. We are a diverse maritime region with thousands of islands and languages, but all of these could be lost if the world does not do anything now to decarbonize and reduce greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. And international shipping is a key emitting sector that is outside of UNFCCC nationally determined contributions. The Pacific Islands more than any other have the right to speak out at the IMO. Others, concern, others are concerned about preser preserving and protecting their exports and trade, but it is the survival of our peoples and our cultures that are at stake here on, on the shores in the Pacific. Thank you, Thomas.